You did not come here to hear the secret fan fiction adventures of Sarah Hodge Weatherby. You came here to hear <laughs> yes, about we did. Steampunk. <laughs> well, we could do that panel. It could be fun. <laughs> Um, so, welcome. Thank you guys. This is my last panel for the weekend. I'm so excited to see all of you guys here. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I see a lot of familiar faces that have been coming all weekend. Some, some very familiar and some having been familiar from over the weekend. And um, I, before I get started, I just want to tell you guys how much I appreciate being here every year. Thank you guys so much for coming to so many of my panels. And for the new folks that didn't come to anything else, welcome. I'm happy to have you here today. And I, I hope you enjoy what you see. Um, Inconceivable brings me back almost every year, so far anyway. Hopefully that will continue. Uh, maybe not if I go into my fan fiction adventures. We'll see what else um, Almost every year. There's been two years. I know. So every year. Technically every year. Well, they, they oh. were thinking about it the first. The, the, there was an invisible year that didn't happen, but I almost was there. Um, yeah. So I'm sure I will be back again next year, and I hope to see all of you guys again. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I have an hour to do this. The panel, this panel is actually designed, funny enough, like my first one of the weekend, uh, to be about an hour and a half. Um, so there's a couple of places where we're going to go a bit quickly, but I think it'll work better because they're basically, um, there's a section that's just books, movies, TV shows that are steampunk that you can see to just give you some examples. Um, I do not, unfortunately, have my bibliography with me this weekend. Um, but if you would like a list of any of the things that you're about to see in here, if you'd like to see any of these films or reading these books, um, grab a business card, email me, and I'll be happy to actually send you the bibliography that I used to put this together so you can have a look at all of this stuff. But in the meantime, let's start talking about steampunk. So in order to talk about steampunk, we have to uh, talk about what steampunk is in the first place. Um, and it, what seems kind of straightforward is actually kind of a funny thing to talk about because there is some debate in the steampunk community and with people that do steampunk on what exactly steampunk is, what falls under steampunk. Um, much like my philosophy on cosplay, my philosophy on steampunk is if you kind of are into it and you want to say it's steampunk, it's steampunk. I don't see a problem with it. Um, I think the more stuff that's inclusive in steampunk, the more people that are interested in steampunk, the more fun we all have together. Um, but to kind of give a basic um, idea, uh, over idea of what steampunk is, the idea of steampunk is a style of science fiction that takes the idea of modern technology, anything you can think of that we have in the modern world, and tries to imagine what it would be like if it was powered by technology that was around roughly in the late 1800s. Um, now sometimes this means that it's a, it's a type of speculative fiction that you'll see set in the late 1800s, but with some modern technology. So perhaps it's a story or a film that takes place in 1896, but they have iPads and they have steam-powered cars and giant submarines and all sorts of things. Um, sometimes uh, steampunk is set uh, in the present time or even in the future time, but those time periods still have a Victorian sensibility. So perhaps it's a alternative fiction where uh, the, Br the Britain Empire actually became the world power, never fell apart, it's continued up till now, and now all of these sensibilities are still being used. So again, it, it's a little bit flexible. There's different ways to do steampunk. There's different types of stories with steampunk. Um, my favorite way of describing steampunk, um, I heard this and I just thought it was the, a wonderful description of it, is uh, steampunk is what the past would look like if the future had happened sooner. And I just think that's such a lovely way of putting it. Now, there are subgenres of steampunk uh, that do something slightly different, um, and I want to go over them, but I also want to say in the course of the panel, just to keep things easy, we're going to call all of this stuff steampunk, even though technically some of it's a little bit different. Um, there is a subgenre called clock punk, which is the same basic idea, except the technology is using some kind of clockwork-based technology. It's usually set in pre-Victorian times or a culture that's existed since pre-Victorian times. Um, there's also diesel punk, um, which is the idea that it uses technology from slightly uh, more recent than the Victorian era, usually somewhere between uh, the very early 1900s and sometimes all the way up to World War II, depending on who's writing the story or, or creating the movie. Um, and this also, like steampunk, uses fashion, pop culture, all sorts of things from that same time period. Um, so the big question says, where does steampunk come from? 
Um, what's interesting is, is when you ask a lot of people, what is steampunk? Have you read something that's steampunk? One of the first answers I usually get is, oh yeah, I've read steampunk. Um, we did Jules Verne's when I was in college, or I read World of Worlds when I was, you know, uh, in, in fifth grade. Um, and the funny thing about it is those things are not actually technically steampunk. Um, what they are is they're speculative fiction um, that are uh, books that usually came out in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so they had some of the sensibilities of steampunk because at the time that was science fiction. That was saying, we're going to assume we have the same technology we have now or, or technology based on the technology we have now, but what might happen in the future? Um, and of course, these were all things uh, like the works of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Um, there's also later uh, famous works in the 20th century that were science fiction stories set in the Victorian period. Um, these are not uh, steampunk. These are speculative fiction that inspire steampunk later on. Um, the term steampunk doesn't actually come into existence until the late eight, uh, 1980s. Um, the author K.W. Jetter um, was uh, uh, given the, the term or used it um, to kind of describe a group of stories that were set in the Victorian period and written during the time period where um, cyberpunk was very popular and wanted to, to, to describe something that was a little bit different than cyberpunk. So what cyberpunk, since steampunk sort of is the younger cousin of or, uh, cyberpunk, he's the, they're the red-headed little brother of cyberpunk, um, cyberpunk has some parts of it that um, are very important to the type of story it is. Generally, cyberpunk talks about science fiction in a future where technology has overcome society. Technology is society. Everything in society is, is based around technology. Um, cyberpunk tends to have darker themes in it. Um, there's a lot of themes like freedom versus security, um, who owns your thoughts and, and your behaviors, um, how is biology used. If we, become the, we have the ability to, to manipulate biology, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Does it get abused? Does it not get abused? Who can controls that, um, is nature versus science, and is there even a, a conflict between those two things? Does nature and science always have to be in conflict, or can they work together? Um, cyberpunk also generally tends to involve rebellion against authority. That's a huge part of cyberpunk a lot of the time. Um, and not always, but generally cyberpunk tends to be fairly dystopian. Um, now, a lot of people have seen cyberpunk, have been in cyberpunk and not even known it. Um, our culture has tons and tons of different cyberpunk uh, things that have become famous. Obviously, The Matrix uh, was one of the big ones for my sort of, I was in college when The Matrix came out and everyone's going, oh my god, this totally blew my mind. Um, I'm watching it again, not quite as mind-blowing as I remember, but, um, but definitely influenced by cyberpunk. Everything, um, not surprising, a lot of anime is influenced by cyberpunk. Um, and this became a very important part of science fiction, particularly in the 80s. Um, steampunk, interestingly enough, was almost invented as a response to cyberpunk um, and kind of came out as, a, as an alternative to cyberpunk. So steampunk does a few things very differently. Um, not always, but generally tends to have a little bit of a lighter tone. Um, uh, steampunk really likes to get back to some of that uh, turn of the century idea of adventure and discovery as being something wonderful. We can't wait to go find out what's beyond that horizon. Um, science generally is, is done as a positive thing. Technology is seen as something to embrace and not necessarily fear. Again, these are generalizations. There are steampunk things that also touch on some cyberpunk themes at the same time. Um, but generally, it tends to show science in a more positive light. Um, and it also tends to celebrate history, um, showing it as something positive along with uh, the idea of looking forward to the future and looking forward to new technology. Um, it kind of has this idea of recapturing some of that old feel of things like what Jules Verne and H.G. Wells were doing. Um, and of course, steampunk literature, after I just went through the whole thing about this, is not actually steampunk literature. But usually when people are, start to get into steampunk, I recommend reading some of these classics because you get to see where some of this stuff started and then later on inspired other writers. Um, so I love to kind of recommend some very beginning. Um, but of course, you walk into any public library and you're going to see a lot of steampunk on the shelf these days. Um, young adult literature is starting to spill over to, into steampunk very much. Um, some of my favorite books are things like um, Corsets and Clockwork because they're um, anthology books. They're short stories for, for steampunk. So people that have never really read steampunk or are interested in steampunk but don't know if they want to do an entire um, book all on its own, I can give them 
them something like that, and they have the ability to read a few short stories and see if they like it. Yes, my friend. Um, the Bone Shaker series by Sherry Priest is actually excellent. If mm. anybody hasn't read it, I highly recommend it. The, it's um, as if the Civil War never truly ended. The first book of The Bone Shaker is actually set in Seattle, and the other subsequent books are, there's one in New Orleans, there's one um, post-Civil War, Abraham Lincoln is still alive, like really cool alternate history stuff and she is an excellent writer. She's well. a very so I excellent writer. Um that, and, that and again the kind of yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, Hans? So I said that entire series is phenomenal. And try explaining like, it to somebody else, be like, oh, there's zombies, and there's steampunk, and like, I don't know how you'd like this, but awesome, so please. <laughs> well, and that's one of the nice things about exactly. a lot of the steampunk genre that I like is that, um, and we'll, we're actually going to get to it a little bit in a minute, even more, but, oh, that's okay. Sorry. Four, four, go, there might be frost giants, who knows what's going on. Um, so, <laughs> Um, that's also one of the things that I love about it is that, as you were saying, it's, it is steampunk, but it's also uh, alternate history. It's also, there's the zombies and some of the supernatural stuff in there. So it's this wonderful mix of different things. And funny enough, we are finding that a lot of steampunk um, does that. It brings other things into it as well and sort of uses it all together. Uh, these are some more uh, examples of some very popular uh, uh, books that are out right now. I have now. read every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I confess I have not, and I'm the librarian, so I the, probably the, should be ashamed of myself. The second book but. for Incarceron came out, and it, it's better than the first book. Mm -mm. I have to get it. I haven't read the second one. I found the first one fascinating, but I, I haven't gotten around to the second one yet. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, Scott Westerfield can do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. I, I was going to say, what, what's your opinion on uh, the Leviathan series? I, I very much liked it. Uh, funny enough, I, even though it's a very different story, I did not find it surprising that it was the same guy that wrote the Uglies stuff, because there's things in it that... It's not the same at all, but there's ways that he writes, and there's ways he writes characters that I find reminiscent of that without that being a carpet like copy. Young adult kind of theme, mm -hmm. I know the Uglies is billed as mm -hmm. young adult. So but the nice thing is that similar. it's definitely young adult, but the nice thing about the way, and, and um, several of these up here actually, um, while they are marketed as young adult, they are very accessible to adults as well, mm -hmm. uh, which without getting off topic, because this is a whole different panel, which is actually true of a lot of young adult literature these days anyway. Um, really good New York Times uh, article recently about how young adult literature is actually as popular with adults as a lot of young adults. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, series, and I, it's one of the ones I do recommend. Um, I have not got a chance to start reading the Clockwork Angel series yet, uh, but um, a lot of my teens absolutely adore it. They've been, they've been knocking on the back of my head going, Miss Terry, you got to read this. I want to talk to you about it. Um, but, um, but yeah, and it's, it's all over the place. There's lots of choices. Um, as we were just talking about, there's also a very large kind of subgenre of steampunk that mixes other elements, particularly magic or supernatural elements. That's a very popular thing right now. Um, I think it's a little bit kind of coming after the whole uh, Twilight craze <coughs> a few years ago and uh, vampires and werewolves and all this sort of thing um, with steampunk sort of adding those elements into it. Um, and so sometimes it can be uh, something that will appeal to readers on many different levels, some with the science fiction but also with some fantasy elements or some other alternative history, things like that. And of course comics, we have lots of comics that dip into steampunk. Um, Hellboy can. I don't put him up here because he's not solely st uh, with steampunk, but there are elements of Hellboy or stories in Hellboy that definitely touch on steampunk. Um, however, um, Mike Mignola's uh, amazing screw on head is definitely in the steampunk category. Um, amongst other, uh, but there's also a supernatural element in this as well. Um, Calamity Jack and also the uh, follow-up Rapunzel's Revenge is lovely because it mixes fairy tales, westerns, and steampunk all in one set of books. Um, really wonderful retelling of old fairy tales we're all very familiar with. Uh, Rapunzel is also a bad... Bad, is anyone really young in the audience? Okay, badass. I can say badass. Um, she's a badass cowgirl that ropes people with her hair. And breaks the I mean, just really, really yes. wonderful stuff. And there's airships, and there's ogres, and there's all sorts of things going on. Again, one of those things that mixes some fantasy elements along with the steampunk. Um, Lady Mechanica, this is a little bit harder to find. I believe this is out of print now. Um, but, I, but I bought one from Modern Myths. You did? Ago. Ooh, I was, Modern yeah, Myths. Definitely go. Um, and I may be wrong. It may not be out of print, but I haven't seen a, a volume of it out for a while. Um, 
uh, a little bit of a rough book for some folks. It's definitely adult-oriented, but League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was one of the first really best-selling books that touched not only on steampunk, but also on the idea of using Victorian literary characters in a very interesting way. Um, for those of you that have seen the film uh, and not read the comic, I'd like to warn folks that there are some very rough spots in it with some very adult themes and some very violent things that happen. I still love it. I think it's an excellent book. And I think what the, the nastiness that happens in it is appropriate to the storytelling. Um, but there is violence. There is rape. There is some other things in there. So if those are things that you're not particularly comfortable reading about, I would definitely skip this one. I do think it's a worthy a comic, however, having said that. I heard rumor that they were redoing the movie. I heard that too, but I don't oh, know I'm if it's true. It yeah, it'd be nice to... I know they're still going to have to cut some of that stuff, unless they make it really... Not even rated R. I think it would be beyond that with the original source... I think the original source material would definitely cross over into that. I think they could do some minor editing and make it an R movie, mm -hmm. um, would still while still holding some of the same feel to what was going on in the book without perhaps going quite as far as the book did. Um, Iron West, again, there's, uh, we'll get into this a little bit later, a little bit more, but there's this really interesting theme now where a lot of people like to mix, mix westerns with steampunk. There's something about those two things that seem to go together very well. Um, and this book is about an invasion of metal men from space in a small western town and what sort of happens to them. Um, <laughs> if you have not read this wonderful, wonderful book, Girl Genius, it's very funny, uh, female protagonist, a lot of my teens, although I'd, I'd say it's older teen to, to young adults, but even some of my younger teens really like it. It sort of depends on the person. Um, but definitely, Girl Genius, uh, I believe you still can read the webcomic, but there's several collected editions of the webcomic that are out in book form. We have them at the library. Um, really funny and really brings back that feel of like the really adventurous, kind of over-the-top, fun science fiction um, also, we see a lot of steampunk and diesel punk in film. Uh, no matter what you think of the film, uh, Sucker Punch definitely falls into, at least large portions of it fall into the uh, diesel punk area. Um, there's also some interesting book adaptations that take a, uh, a very heavy steampunk feel to it. Uh, the Golden Compass, while not straight out of steampunk novel, has steampunk elements, and they very much play them up in the film version. Um, the series of unfortunate events, which are wonderful books, if you haven't read them, go. They're not strictly steampunk, but some of Violet's inventions definitely fall into the steampunk category, um, and the, the aesthetic of the film is very, very much influenced by steampunk. Totally goofy, ridiculous, over-the-top, fun monster movies, but definitely worth it for the steampunk angle. Um, Van Helsing, of course, in the top corner. And because I loved Hawkeye so much, you have to love Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters. Ridiculously stupid, but really fun popcorn flicks, especially if you like monsters exploding, all sorts of fun things. Um, but their weaponry and some of their equipment is most definitely steampunk-influenced. Um, most people don't think of The Prestige as being a steampunk movie or a, a diesel punk movie, and it's a mystery movie and there's some odd elements to it, but the science fiction elements in it definitely fall into those categories. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil too much for you, but let's just say if you like Nicholas Telsa, you're really going to like this. Okay. So I know, every time I put this on screen, everyone groans and rolls their eyes, and yes, it's not a particularly great movie, but if people, well, it, it can, there's like parts it. that's it's really fun. It is entertaining. It's, um, it's not a great movie, but I think it's a fun, fun popcorn flick. You're, you're not going to watch it and feel bad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Having, and you know what, I'm sorry, I still work out to the gym to the Will Smith rap. It's, it's, it's perfect. It's exactly three and a half miles per per minute when you're, or per hour, I'm sorry, when you're walking on the treadmill, the beat is perfect. <laughs> um, so if nothing else, when people don't know what steampunk is, I tell them, sit down, watch this movie. If nothing else, watch the aesthetic, watch the, the devices, watch all the sort of mad scientist stuff, and you're going to have a really good idea of what steampunk is like. Having said that, I love the fact that they end the whole movie with a cheesy 15,000 foot tarantula that's all about <laughs> steam and fire and, you know, come on. I mean, that's just so much fun. You, you have to love it. Like a giant fire-breathing spider. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for those that, uh, again, not a great adaptation, but the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen film also um, very clearly will show what steampunk is um, in the devices that are used. I actually don't hate this movie as much as other people. I definitely prefer the comic, um, and I think they drop the ball in parts of the film pretty badly. But I do think there's some stuff in here that's pretty brilliant uh, as films go, and there's some really interesting... 
excuse me, there's some interesting character stuff that I really like. The um, I'm sorry? The automobile. Oh, yes, I exactly, the automobile. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't like the fact, and don't get me wrong, I love The Incredible Hulk, but I didn't like the fact that they nice hide up to this sort of misunderstood monster thing, because that's obviously not what he is at all. I'll help you. Um, right, right, that was a bad mistake. But, but there are elements of the film that are very good, and again, if you want to get an idea of what steampunk is, seeing the aesthetics in this film really helps. It's a, a good first people. introduction to people that don't exactly. quite know yeah, I, I never knew the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was a was a comic book. First time I saw it, I I fell in love with it. I, st I still love it. Anytime it's on TV, I turn to it. I love it. And you know what? That's awesome. Like, and I I want to. I should have actually started off by saying that. Obviously, I have my opinions on a lot of these films, but I don't want anyone to feel like my opinion is the Boy, right my one. Opinion is right. right, right. If you if there's a book here that I love and you think is horrible, absolutely think it's like that's good. We should have a conversation about that. If there's a movie I think is terrible but you thought it was the coolest thing in the world, again, that's a great conversation to have. Don't apologize, not that you did, but no one should apologize for the movies and the books that they like. Um, but uh, I did, again, the comic's rough. It, it depends on what your personal comfort zone is with some things. I think the comic was much more... Um, morally ambiguous, which is what I liked about it, because there are characters that you know are kind of supposed to be the heroes, quote-unquote, and I use that in a very loose sense in this, um, but they are really not nice people at all, and it's very hard to tell sometimes in the book who you're supposed to be rooting for, which I liked, because it's interesting. It's very different than anything I ever saw, but I do understand why a lot of people didn't like it. There's some parts of it that are extremely rough to get through. Um, the Time Machine, of course, being based on the H.G. Wells book, um, there's very uh, different incarnations. There's steampunk elements to how the designs are done here. One of the things I particularly love about these films is that the description of what the Time Machine looks like in H.G. Wells' original book, um, when you see all these film versions, while there is a slight difference and they adapt the design, they all basically look the same. He did such a great job describing what in his head this would look like that all of these films have used that exact same description, built more or less the same thing, and come up with almost the exact same machine. And this guy wrote this book at the turn of the century, or the turn of the last century, in fact. Um, that's some writing, <laughs> and I think that's just really wonderful. Um, but of course, there's been many different adaptations of this particular film, so you can sort of pick which one you like. Um, but again, it's a very good introduction to that sort of thing. Um, very strange film. Not a lot of people have seen it. Uh, the City of Lost Children. It's a French film that came out in the mid-1990s. Um, Ron Perlman is in it, and it's one of the best performances he's ever given, and he barely speaks in the entire thing. Um, but it is a sort of uh, somewhat steampunk, somewhat diesel punk fantasy film about a scientist that steals the dreams of children and a small girl that goes off with a circus strongman to save her little brother from this particular scientist. It, as much as it sounds like it, it's not a children's film, although I would say it's probably okay for much older kids to teenagers. Um, it's also all in French, so a lot of people find it tedious with the subtitles. I think it's a fabulous movie, and I highly recommend it. What was the title again? The City of Lost Children. It's, and uh, again, with the aesthetic, it's very much steampunk. Um, but it's a very interesting movie. And, of course, the Sherlock Holmes films uh, mm -hmm. that came out with Robert Downey Jr. have very uh, heavy steampunk overtones as well. Um, Hellboy, as I said earlier, itself is not necessarily steampunk, but there are some clock punk and some other steampunk elements to it. The uh, wind-up clockwork Nazi from the first movie is very much in that kind of clockwork uh, horror uh, idea. Um, and then the Golden Army also has some uh, elements in it as well. Um, neither of these films are strictly diesel punk, but they have diesel punk overtones, and I also love the fact that they bring back sort of the old pulp feel that a lot of diesel punk tries to, to bring forward. Um, out of the two of them, I prefer The Rocketeer. I think it does a better job of sort of bringing that feeling forward, um, but they both do a pretty good job of it. Um, Sky Captain was interesting. I, I'd recommend at least one viewing of it just to kind of see what you think. Um, it's very polarizing. You either sort of hate it or people think it's amazing. It's very little in between. And animated films, of course. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Atlantis, The Lost Empire. As far as I'm concerned, it's one of Disney's forgotten films that should never be forgotten. I know some other people in the room also might agree with me on that one. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful steampunk story that celebrates a lot of things that steampunk celebrates. It, it celebrates uh, discovery. It celebrates these, uh, these ancient uh, uh, civilizations that we're having this contact with for the first time. I love the fact that the main character is a nerd. He's this 
sort of, you know, geeky guy that gets to be the hero and save the day because he uses his abilities of, you know, uh, science and thought and, and intelligence. Um, yeah, he does a little fighting in it too, but most of it, what actually happens is because he's a smart scientist guy. Um, and of course, the, the she's a Disney princess, so though she's more than your typical Disney princess, main character is also a wonderful character, but they're all wonderful characters. Um, and it's a very interesting film. It doesn't feel like much else that Disney has done. Um, several years later, they also did Treasure Planet, of course, based on Treasure Island. Um, not quite as well put together, I don't think, as Atlantis, but there's some really wonderful stuff in there. There's some wonderful characters. And it has this really great mix of sort of steampunk aesthetic with this almost like gleeful space exploration that reminds me a little of some Japanese anime um, that's used steampunk. In fact, we'll get into a little of that in a minute. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on her, the captain's name, but Emma Thompson plays the oh, main Captain. Captain Amelia. Captain Amelia, thank you. Plays Captain Amelia. It's been several years since I've seen it, and she's actually one of my absolute favorite Disney characters ever just because she's so brilliant. She's um, so I highly recommend both of these. Both can be found on Netflix. I'm sorry? Good cosplay. I'd love to figure it out. I've seen people do it. You can find it online, but I'd love to do it. Um, so going from Disney to Japan, um, steampunk also shows up a bit in anime. I actually have an entire panel that talks about steampunk and anime, so we're only going to touch on it here. Um, obviously, uh, the film Steam Boy, just right in its title, tells you it's going to be a steampunk anime. It's an excellent story, um, very adventurous, and um, mixes some English and steampunk aesthetic with some Japanese storytelling techniques in, in a wonderfully seamless way. It's a very well done story. Um, Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water was a television series that came out in the early uh, 1990s. Um, this was very loosely, and I mean in the loosest way possible, based on uh, 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, there's also a very heavy uh, Search for Atlantis uh, theme to it as well. They're looking for the lost city. Um, and the, the technology in it is wonderful. Um, it's very steampunk with some tiny overtones of diesel punk, but mostly steampunk. Um, Wonderful main character, um, great for kids, but also one of those shows that adults can watch as well, so I highly recommend that one. Um, funny enough, this is what Treasure Planet reminds me a little of. Galaxy Express 999, there's some elements that the two of them share. Um, while it's pretty much straight out of sci-fi uh, space romp, uh, the fact that they go through space on a steam-powered train is a little strange. Um, and so, again, some of the aesthetic and, and character design is very much a steam-based anime. Miyazaki is famous for using these things in his anime, some very blatantly and straight out. Uh, Howl's Moving Castle, for example, uses a lot of steampunk um, mixed with magic, as we were saying earlier. Um, I also love the fact that so many of his flying devices are obviously based off of diesel punk, particularly uh, Castle in the Sky with the Sky Pirates. Um, if you do enough steampunk, you will realize that steampunk and diesel punk people love sky pirates. There's something about pirates. It's like cowboys. It's this weird, like, cowboys and pirates thing. Um, but we love sky pirates, and Miyazaki uses them to their full extent in Castle in the Sky. Um, I also love the fact that the flying devices, they are diesel-powered in Castle in the Sky, are very heavily based on natural designs. So you see this really interesting blend of nature with sort of the dragonfly designs or dragonfly wings along with the technology, and it makes this very interesting blend of a lot of different themes. Um, there is a, a wonderful anime, Samurai 7, that's loosely based off of the famous Kurosawa movie, The Seven Samurai. And while there's a lot of uh, over steampunk themes, uh, one of the main characters is a uh, person that decides that he wants to be a samurai, so he is converted completely into a steampunk powered cyborg. Um, which is a very interesting character. My personal favorite part of that is he is the comedic character in the series, and when he gets upset, uh, these little, uh, what makes up the helmet and sort of these little horns off of the stylistic samurai mask also are the vents that take the steam out of his body, and he'll get angry and steam will start coming out of both sides, <laughs> which is very funny and a very lovely sort of way of reminding you that's how this actually is working. Uh, Full Metal Alchemist most definitely has steampunk overtones uh, to it, um, particularly with some of the technology that you see. And again, one of those things that mixes steampunk and magic. The Last Exile, uh, not as well known as some of these others, but um, does some really interesting things. We have 
Um, both diesel punk and the fact that most of the, the um, sky uh, uh, pirates and various uh, groups are flying machines. I wouldn't even really call them planes. They're sort of interestingly designed. That are definitely diesel powered, but there's also some steam powered technology. Uh, for example, early in the series, there's a battle that happens between two ships where soldiers literally come to the outside, as you can see here, line up with their rifles, and the rifles are attached to large steam powered uh, propulsion units um, by a large pipe. So when they actually fire their guns, a burst of steam comes out, and that's what's uh, doing the projectiles across to the other ship. So they mix all of these different things together. There's diesel punk, and there's also steampunk elements. Um, and some of the some of the uh, the kind of over idea of the series touches on some cyberpunk themes. So it's a very interesting mix of all three of these. Um, and while I would not call Attack on Titan a straight out steampunk anime, there's some interesting things with their technology, particularly with the maneuverability gear when they go fight the Titans, that are definitely uh, steampunk and diesel punk um, inspired. And we've also seen some steampunk on TV. Um, Legend of Korra particularly used a lot of steampunk ideas and steampunk technology. Uh, for the old folks in the room, does anyone remember Briscoe County Jr., my favorite yes. show back when I was a young teenager? Also the first thing I ever saw Bruce Campbell in. Um, if you get a chance to see it, it is a bizarre mix, again, of science fiction, uh, western, steam, aliens, government agents, men in black, all sorts of bizarre things all sort of thrown together. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff, and then of course... Bruce Campbell. You can't lose. Um, so it's, it's not easy to find, but apparently there was a DVD release in the mid-2000s um, that you can still sometimes find used copies of. I highly recommend it. Very, very strange little show. Um, on top of some other things, um, Sci-Fi Channel has put out several interesting miniseries that definitely have steampunk um, overtones. Tin Man, um, in many ways, has... Um, again, well, I wouldn't call it a straight-out steampunk piece. Um, there's some steampunk overtones, particularly with certain designs, um, between some different technology. It's a very interesting retelling of the Wizard of Oz story. And steampunk, of course, has made uh, appearances in video games. Bioshock 2 uh, definitely has this steampunk overtone to it. Uh, Wild Arms from the PlayStation, back in the old days, when we still <laughs> were blowing into cartridges. Uh, no. Uh, so that, that definitely has a, a steampunk overview to it. Final Fantasy, in many different incarnations, has done stories that are either very steampunk or at least have steampunk elements to them, depending on the game. And uh, this is Sakura Wars, where uh, uh, Victorian-era Japanese girls power steam-powered uh, giant robots and fight for their country. It's pretty interesting. Um, while pretending to be actors in a theater. Very, very strange. <laughs> it was made into an anime. It was also a set of games. Very interesting little story. Um, but I love the fact that they're giant steam-powered mecha. You don't see that a whole lot, and I thought that was pretty glorious. It's like a pink samurai big daddy. Very much so, actually. That's not a bad way of putting it. Um, uh, American McGee's Alice, uh, while it was a horror game, definitely had some clockwork and steampunk overtones, particularly the scenes with the Mad Hatter Tea Party. Um, a lot of uh, weird technology going on there, um, and used in a very good, very creepy way. What most people don't realize is that there's also steampunk music. Um, there's lots of bands and groups that sort of uh, take on some steampunk aesthetic, do uh, various types of music with a steampunk overtone to it. There's tons of them, and I'm not going to cover all of them here because we could do a whole panel just on that. Um, while the Smashing Pumpkins themselves were not a steampunk band, um, one of their very famous music videos, the Tonight Tonight video that was out uh, back when I was in high school, um, not only had um, some very obvious steampunk influence, but was also heavily influenced by The Journey to the Moon, which is the famous silent film uh, from the turn of the century. Um, and a lot of the imagery and a lot of how they did that was very steampunk. Um, Professor Elemental, uh, there's nothing so awesome as steampunk hip-hop. You never think that's going to be a thing, and then it is. Um, so you can get online and see a lot of these guys. Professor Elemental does some wonderfully funny steampunk hip-hop combinations. Um, he's done several different uh, various uh, songs that um, I actually find to be pretty funny. And of course, his rival, Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer, they will do some face-offs and some uh, rap battles between the two of them that are pretty, pretty damn epic. Um, you've never heard anything so awesome as an ra epic rap battle about how you make your tea. That's, that's <laughs> yes. pretty awesome right there. Um, but they're both excellent, excellent performers. Um, 
<laughs> I'm sure you guys have heard around the internet somewhere just glue some gears on it and call it steampunk, which I'm sure he would hiss at my hat since I glued gears on it. Um, but beside the point, very funny uh, little little piece, and um, I think very tongue in cheek. I like to think there that it's not so much a, a instruction for life rather than just a really good joke. And of course, steampunk in fashion, uh, cosplay or, or costuming. Obviously, there's steampunk elements. Uh, people do steampunk, um, but there's also a lot of fashion designers that have used steampunk um, in various ways. Um, and as we watch uh, some some of the runway shows, you can see more and more companies are using steampunk influence. Um, steampunk can be something as simple as you know having a, a Victorian sensibility and adding a little science fiction to it. It can be as elaborate as doing elaborate pieces. Obviously, the gentleman on the other side. Um, has constructed a piece to make it appear that his arm is an entire um, constructed uh, uh, cyborg-like uh, piece, which is pretty amazing. Uh, this gentleman, while most of this is straight out Victorian, has some very interesting wire work done up in his hair, almost in sort of a matrixy idea as well, um, and some wire work done in the actual uh, outfit. Um, again, so you can go very Victorian, where the, the styles are based very heavily on historically accurate clothing, or you can do things like The Gentleman on the Right, where it is inspired by steampunk, but there's many other elements included into it that are not necessarily from that exact same period. Um, it's one of the things that I love about steampunk is that steampunk as an aesthetic and as a, a, a design really leaves it up to the person to decide how you want to interpret it. Do you want to do a steampunk gothic Lolita? You absolutely can do that. Do you want to wear mo mostly modern clothes but add a little bit of a steampunk look to it? Absolutely, go right for it. Do you want to be a dapper gentleman with your camera? Absolutely, go right for it. Do you kick butt and look awesome in a corset? Absolutely, go right for it. Um, you know, I, I love to wear this when I do my steampunk panel. 90% of what I'm wearing here is pieces that I found from uh, places like Savers and the Salvation Army and simply put small um, adaptations to various things. Um, so you can go everything from being, again, much like cosplay itself. You can have everything from being uh, an absolute uh, seamstress or seamster and uh, you know create your thing completely from scratch. You can use pieces that you can already find. I love the one on the left here. This gentleman has decided that um, on top of going to a convention, he is going to, as a steampunk person in a steampunk outfit, he's actually created an entire character around his steampunk outfit. So he comes as the ship's cook for his airship uh, group. They all go as airship pirates, and he's the cook. So he's put this outfit together, and he's found all of these bits and pieces of kitchenware that he can hang off of it, along with his leather, leather pouches, and has this entire aesthetic going on. Um, but these gentlemen over here on the side, uh, you know, much more put together, much more sort of as a fashion statement. Um, but again, both just as valid. It's simply two different ways of expressing your steampunk uh, looks. Um, for women particularly, especially if we like to do skirts, um, we can do anything from doing skirts and, and dresses that are a little more like what you might actually see in the Victorian era, to adapting that and doing skirts and, and other uh, combinations of clothing that were you actually in the Victorian era, you might get kicked off the street for wearing. Something that I've seen too in doing, I love steampunk and it's what I do a lot of my costuming stuff as, I found a lot more pieces that I could just buy out. I hate to say it, hot topic. Um, hey, whatever being, works for you, man. One, I got an amazing necklace there. I got the shoes I'm wearing now are from Payless. They're yeah. kind of like a men's look. They, it's permeating. $3 so at Savers. I know. There you go. Yeah. It's permeating so much more of just our normal day to day mm -hmm. stuff, wanting to incorporate that. And that's something that I've seen over the past maybe five years or so. That's After true. being able like, I'm just going to go to the mall and I'm going to go see something with gears on it, or, you know, I don't have to shop at, you know, any particular places or anything obscure. I could go to the mall, find you something steampunk that day. Absolutely. That would be yeah. Yes, my friend. There's also a lot of, like, great steampunk stuff at, um, we write comics. Mm -hmm. I saw yep. a necklace, it was, like, a heart-shaped necklace, and it like, was made out of gears and stuff. Well, one of the things that I really love about that is the fact that this opens up steampunk to anybody. So let's say, for example, you're not a particularly crafty person. You don't enjoy crafting stuff, but you want a steampunk necklace. You can go to all of those places and find it. If I happen to like being crafty and I want to try to create some of my own jewelry, it's very easy for me to go out and find pieces or go to a flea market and find different things and try it myself. It, it's absolutely up to your comfort level and whatever you want to do. Um, there is, and I don't usually don't get too much into it in this panel because, again, I like, I like the more positive vibe. There is kind of an undertone sometimes, especially with older old fogies like me that have been in the steampunk world for a while, of this sort of like, if you don't make it yourself, or 
if it's not a functional piece or if it's not all of this stuff, then you're not really into steampunk. How many people here are on my Cosplayers for Everything panel this weekend? All right, what do you guys think I'm about to say about what I think about that? If you are having you. fun, and if you think it's steampunk, it's steampunk. There you go. Very well done. My philosophy on any of this stuff, be it cosplay, be it steampunk, be it what your favorite science fiction is, I don't care what it is. Are you having a good time with it? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Does it make you feel good? Then who the hell am I to tell you it's not whatever it is? I don't care that your steampunk and your steampunk and your steampunk and your steampunk and my steampunk are maybe different steampunks. Why is that a difference? Why is that an issue? Are you happy doing what you're doing? You having a good time today? Yeah? Okay, good, because you looked like maybe you weren't for a second. <laughs> no, you're having a good time. Guess what? That's awesome. That, for me, should make me happy. It doesn't matter that we're dressed differently or that you may not be doing the exact same thing I'm doing. As long as you're enjoying yourself, who cares? So I don't really hold to that whole, like, if you buy it at Hot Topic, it's not really steampunk. I don't care about that. And, and I don't really don't. I think most thinking people wouldn't either because there's no harm to it. Um, if you happen to be an amazing crafter who can build totally functional steampunk design uh, machines and have it pour your tea or, you know, do something on your... I mean, I have, I have something I've been trying to figure out to do for a long time. This is my steampunk librarian. I'm always adding pieces to her. And one of the things I'd like to do is figure out how to make a piece that I found based off of an old gamble cheating device that they used to wear a small box up in their sleeves and when you flexed your wrist a, a scissor arm would come out and deposit the cheating card in your hand so it literally was an ace up your sleeve and what I'd like to do is figure out how to recreate that and have something where I could flex my arm and my business cards would pop out of underneath my sleeve and I could hand you a business card this is a really cool idea do I have any clue how to even start doing this yet no idea and I've been looking at designs and I've been asking people for two years now and I haven't even started trying to do it yet because I know for a fact that I'm not that mechanically inclined eventually I am gonna try it and I probably won't be able to do it I'll probably mess it up 20 or 30 or 40 times before Maybe I'll figure it out, and I might never figure it out. But it's fun, and I like the figuring out part. But that might not be how you have fun, or it might not be how you have fun. Everyone's going to do this in a different way, and that's okay. Whatever it is that you're enjoying about it, that's what you should enjoy about it. Um, and I don't believe in elitism in anything, because I just think all elitism does is to put us against each other, and why are we doing that? We're all dorks in costumes. We're all dorks reading our favorite books. We're all nerds doing our favorite stuff. We should be inclusive nerds. If nothing else, who wants to be exclusive? Who, you know, we all, I'm th we've all been, no matter who you are, I know we've all been in a situation where we were the guys on the outside. They didn't want you in their group, or you didn't, they didn't want you at the party, or they didn't want you in the library study session, or whatever it is. That feels like crap. Nobody wants to do that. So why do we want to do, you know, who would want to do it to each other? Let's all be inclusive and say, your steampunk isn't exactly like mine, but it's awesome. Come on over here. I want to know where you got that. I want to connect with you and find those things out. Um, and I think that's very important. And I love the fact that you guys brought up Hot Topic and all of those things, because those are valuable resources for people that want to, to do this and maybe don't want to do it just like everybody else. The only thing I would say about Hot Topic is that their stuff is massively overpriced for the quality you get. Well, that... Totally <laughs> totally right, 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 right. One of those, oh, I saw this. I don't know if I'll find this again anywhere and just bought it. Right, of course. Right, I and to be honest with you, I, I have to admit I do find it a little funny that they're owned by the same company as The Gap, so I always kind of go like, yeah. with all the, I'm totally against those people in The Gap, and I want to be like, yeah, <laughs> well actually, you know, maybe, maybe you should Not have more so common. Much. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's joking around aside. It's every everyone's sort of version of, of sort of what they want to do. Um, I include the I love to include these as well because it shows a, a, these are both designed with a little bit of a Victorian aesthetic. Um, sometimes you'll see girls uh, with the bustles, which I still I, I have a wonderful yeah, it's a great thing. Um, you can actually uh, you can craft bustles, you can buy them. Um, I makeshifted one by putting a couch pillow and a couple of pieces of cloth and tying it around my waist at one point. Uh, lots of ways you can do. That um, and again, all by what you want to experiment with. Um, I, I again, I love the sort of thing. There's something about the one on the right that I really dig. I love that kind of like strange. It's almost like a combination of steampunk and almost like 1920s sort of aesthetic, where with the, you can see the under hoop of the skirt and all of that sort of thing. I really love it. Almost like neo deco kind of a thing. Um, but again, two very different versions of a, a steampunk idea that both look amazing. It's just two different personalities, two different kinds. Um, and of course, there's some things that come up in steampunk a lot. Um, we love little teeny hats for some reason. Sometimes we like big hats, but we love teeny hats, and teeny hats are awesome. 
um, particularly teeny top hats, but you'll sometimes see little teeny bowler hats and other things. Um, we also love shiny stuff. We're like crows. We love to see watches and washers and anything metal. Keys. We love keys. Skeleton keys are the coolest thing in the world because you never know where this might fit and open up. Um, and one of the wonderful things about steampunk is that we're also seeing a lot more multiculturalism. So while steampunk did come out of the idea of Victorian aesthetic and originally sort of an English Victorian aesthetic, there's lots of elements that are coming into steampunk from lots of different cultures and lots of different people and making it as inclusive as possible. And as we just, as you just heard in my 20-minute rant earlier, I like anything that includes as many people that want to be part of it as possible. So here's some wonderful variations on um, different types of steampunk. I'm particularly very fond of the young, this young lady um, who puts Hindu and um, other cultural things from her own background into her steampunk by creating traditional Hindu and Indian jewelry with gears and things that will come from you know, various parts. And you can see both the traditional style of that jewelry mixed with the idea of steampunk. It's really, really wonderful. Um, the, the much better view of some of her stuff. Um, just really, really wonderfully creative, celebrating her background and her family and her culture by also mixing together with something else um, that I just think is absolutely glorious. It's one of my absolute favorites. Um, of course, the Victorian era, I don't want to get too much into uh, history because there's some Let's be honest, there's some ugly things that go along with the Victorian era. But if nothing else, the Victorian era was known for being interested in sort of sending people out. Um, British fashion at the time very much incorporated a lot of um, cloth and patterns from Asia and other parts of the world because it was a big deal if you were rich enough to be able to go over there. Um, so a lot of steampunk will start incorporating some of these things. Um, this lady has incorporated some various um, Asian uh, cloth and, and Japanese patterns into her steampunk. Uh, the young lady over on the uh, right-hand side uh, is Native American. She celebrates her own uh, culture by mixing steampunk and Native American elements. Um, I, again, don't want to get too heavily into this because it's not the theme of the panel, but this also leads to some very interesting discussions back and forth about um, cultural appreciation versus cultural... Um, What's the word of appropriation. appropriation? Thank you. I should know this. Um, and those are very good conversations to have, and there's some important stuff going on on both sides. Um, there's also a lot of gray areas, so it's still a conversation that's happening, and it's still something that really needs to to be discussed, um, it, particularly in a historical ca context, as I said, the Victorians, while interested in a lot of this stuff, were not always particularly great at respecting where it was coming from or using it in an appropriate manner. Um, but I do think, again, it's a wonderful conversation, and, and the more inclusive and the more people that are welcome into this, the better that conversation gets, I think. Um, Oh, this young lady does some really wonderful stuff. I've seen a few of hers on there. You know, the, I just realized something awful. I have to revamp this panel because I forgot to put the artist's name on here. Don't do that. If you're watching this video, never forget to put the artist's name on here. Um, if anyone's interested in finding out who these folks are, grab my card. I will go back into my notes and make sure you get the artist's names. Um, but uh, again, this idea of sort of mixing these different cultural elements. Um, one of the things... Oh, I... When is this slide here? Oh, I'm not. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. I thought it was earlier in the presentation. Um, as we talked about before, uh, there's something about steam, uh, steampunk culture and, West, and the West. We love combining those two things. The only thing that we like as much as steam-powered cowboys is steam-powered pirates, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but we love the West. The two of these things fit together very well. And again, it can be everything from very traditional, what you really would have seen someone wearing in, in the Old West, um, to more uh, varied uh, adaptations of that idea. Um, one of the things that I've loved about seeing some steampunk people come forward is that there are several groups of people that um, honor uh, the, the, old, the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, there's a whole idea of a movement of bringing the, the culture and the history of the Buffalo Soldiers into steampunk. And again, that goes with the multiculturalism. It's such a wonderful idea. Now granted, obviously, this is not completely historical. They're putting a new spin on it. But it also, when you see these, these stories come out or people cosplaying or, or dressing in this way and they go well I'm this buffalo soldier here's a history and no one knows what that is they go what's a buffalo soldier and they go ah now I can tell you what that is and it's a moment where you can teach a little bit of history through costuming or through fiction it's a wonderful way of introducing that idea 
Um, and of course, um, a lot of the aesthetic of the different, I love these little mini guns. That's something about the Old West. You always see the Old West movies with the women that have the, you know, they take it out and they shoot you in the back when you don't have the, well, I don't know about you, I shoot people in the back. <laughs> uh, don't ever play cards with me, I'm not a good card player. And as I said earlier, as much as we love our cowboys, we love our airship captains and sky pirates. Um, the one thing I really love about the, about the whole idea of doing airship pirates is that um, people really find amazing ways to bring uh, uh, sort of uh, s stereotypes and things we recognize pirate-wise into steampunk. So things like, rather than eye patches, having fake cybernetic eye pieces instead, you know, things along that line. I really, really love that. And of course, people do various versions of that. Um, there are entire groups that dress steampunk together that go to conventions as a sky pirate team or as an entire crew or however they want to do it. Um, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing steampunk Buttercup and, and oh, Red Pirate Roberts. That, that would be pretty awesome. So cool. Just to think about for next year. Not that this Just isn't awesome. But do you know. it. Um, <laughs> and of course with all these different um, ideas. I love some of the cybernetic work here to the gauges and things to make it look like people are part machine as well. Um, and there's something, I think the Sky Pirates are the ones that do it the most, but everyone sort of does it. Um, there are certain things that will come up in uh, steampunk dress that uh, we really like. So as uh, I was saying earlier, uh, anything shiny, jewelry, we love to be able to do jewelry and other um, aesthetics along that line. Um, obviously, gears are a big deal again. There's that kind of joke about gluing gears on things. I have no problem if you want to put a couple of gears on your hat and they don't actually do anything, go crazy, have fun. Why not? Um, but some interesting things done. This gentleman has made a very interesting um, sort of cybernetic cuff that doubles as a timepiece. So he always knows what time it is as he's walking around. Um, so beautiful and functional. Um, of course, uh, uh, steampunk jewelry is now also a large thing. Uh, guns and props, weapons, uh, you'll see a lot of with steampunk. Did I miss that? Did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go that. for it. Um, I've, no, I've never done steampunk before, but I've always looked... I always loved the look of it, and I'm wanting to like uh, explore into it a little bit. Is like going with the joke a little bit, but also for like just um, to help me get started. Is there a good place to buy gears? Good question. Um, so there's a couple of different things you can do. Um, I love flea markets. I do a lot of flea markets, and if you can find broken watches and other mechanical things along that line that are old enough you can find metal gears. The problem is, is that newer watches that use gears use plastic gears. Um, I've already taken apart a couple of watches from uh, thrift stores and suddenly been like, oh crap, I can't use this. Um, if uh, you can, and I will completely confess to the gears on my hat are exactly this, you also can buy jewelry pieces. You can go into Michael's Craft Store and buy oh, yeah. pieces of jewelry um, that are done at, to shaped as gears. They're metal, they're metal jewelry pieces. They'll even say steampunk. Um, right, right. And now, if I'm, oh, if go for it, please. If I may add as well, eBay. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you, can, yeah. <laughs> you can you can literally buy a bag full of gears on eBay for like less than ten dollars. Well, yeah, eBay and sometimes well. here's the crazy thing about eBay though. So when I first put my steampunk <clears throat> librarian together, all of these fell into keys were from two lots I bought on eBay. And actually, this is nowhere near all the ones I own. I have three or two giant bags at home right now that are. Um, in case these fall off so I can replace them. They were ultra cheap. I got them both for about 10 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. However, this was about four or five years ago. Now that steampunk is a much more of a thing, a lot of those sellers are selling their gears and their keys and things like that for a lot higher because they know that's what people are buying them for and they can get the money. Doesn't mean you can't find them for 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. You just look around. You can find deals sometimes, yeah. but it's not quite as easy as it, as it used to be to find them cheap. And well, at, the very, at the very least, as like, as recent as last year, I looked for gears and things like that and found them for that cheap, so. Uh, very cool. Uh, so definitely I, look. It can yeah. hurt to look, yeah, but you may have to look for a little while. The vendor by the staircase is uh, selling a steampunk style, like, uh, keys. I just bought one. Oh, so. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and of course you can do that as well. If there's things that you're interested in, you can buy stuff already made. Um, again, Etsy, you can do that as well. Um, I, you know, again, it's whatever your personal level of uh, uh, comfort is. Um, the nice thing about buying in bulk when you buy a bag of keys or a bag of gears is that if you start to try to make something and you screw it up and you go, ah, this isn't what I wanted to do, it didn't look the right, you can start again. You can take it apart, use more, you know, you, if you break something, you've got another whole bag of them where, oh, I snapped that gear in half, well, I'll grab another one. Um, it's nice to have, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're itching or putting your oh, hands up. Oh, okay, cool. I know, I've been doing the same thing all morning. It's very dry in here. Um, 
but uh, one of the lovely things about uh, I've seen with some props with steampunk is it's really fun uh, when we've done prop weapons. Um, a lot of people will use things like old Nerf guns and old oh, yeah. water yeah, pistols as a base. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you build up from there, which can be a lot of fun. Um, my clock says five minutes to the end of the panel, so I'm going to kind of run through this just quickly so that you can see some of what I've got up here. But of course, what I was going to say, whoops, is goggles also. You'll see a lot of steampunk goggles. I'm not wearing them today because they don't work particularly well with my hat, but of course, in all different ways. And these were just made, I actually bought those these from a friend that makes them, but these are basically a pair of swim goggles that were adapted with some pieces you were... Yeah, I found five dollars on Amazon, like mechanical welding goggles mm -hmm. that yep. I just painted. Yep. Just with gold and brass. And yep. Fantastic. All Super sorts of things cheap. you can don't do. Pay forty dollars. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, don't you can. It. If there's an artist that you like that you want to support, absolutely do it. But you're right. You can Super you can find pieces and and yeah, do things along some yourself. Like goggles, like the two ones, and then a single uh, one on uh, Wish.com, and they were selling them honestly for like. 10 to 20 dollars. Yeah, so so yeah, exactly. So again, it's all comfort level. You can adapt your own. You can you can buy already done stuff, especially if there's particular artists or particular people you want to. I love doing my own. I love that finding the 10 dollar ones and experimenting with them. But again, it's it's your own comfort level, whatever it is that you'd like to work with. Just make sure um, you're paying for quality. Like on those goggles, oh, right. I can tell they're real brass and leather. So Right. Nice. Were these again? I didn't pay very much for these, but a lot of this is sort of rubber. It's it's you know it's a pair of swim goggles basically. So they're not you know, terribly like as a expensive. As jeweler, back. the hot topic thing makes just makes me angry because I go in there and I'm like, what are you doing? You are terrible. Like, I could make that at all yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just because I love sort of updating the tech, here's here's very briefly some folks that have updated their cell phone and, and created a, a steampunk computer. Um, so let's get through. One of the things I love about steampunk guns, I just want to say this quickly, is the lovely uh, idea of screwing bottles into there with different colored liquids. Uh, you could do some really cool looking stuff. I've even seen people use... Um, uh, some stuff that will react to uh, light, for example, and glow under certain circumstances. People have filled it with. Uh, now, I would like to also point out that these are folks that know what they're doing. So don't just go, hey, this stuff looks kind of cool. I'll throw it in there. You know, we always want to do safety first. So know what you're working with. Um, this is the part I just want to make sure we got to this. One of the things I love about steampunk, as we were saying earlier, is how creative it is and how many different ways you can do steampunk. And one of the things that I always have to admit that just delight me is when I see people take different loves and, make, and, and combine them together. And the idea of taking characters that you love from one genre and making it steampunk, we just <laughs> joked about it, but I think that would be an awesome idea. Um, yes, my friend? I went to a convention and saw steampunk Iron Man. Oh, yes. yes. It was the most incredible thing. Hold was... that thought. We may see the one that you saw. Who knows? Um, this one particularly cracked me up because this is from my generation, a steampunk Laura Croft uh, explorer. Oh, okay. uh, for those who were at the Ghostbusters panel oh, my yesterday, my the steampunk <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, oh, my, my favorite oh, my is the second group here oh. was the Gentleman Stay Puff, which I think is pretty awesome. Oh, my God. Um, but, and these are two different groups. So they did two different versions of what steampunk Ghostbusters might look like, which which, again, so cool. is, is a really wonderful. I'm pretty sure that's a steampunk Janine, which I was like, I might have to do that, actually. <laughs> you um, need to be with a couple other people to get You definitely yeah, do. Yeah, um, two different versions oh. of steampunk Star Wars. Uh, one of my personal favorites is Chewie is a very tall, blonde, Nordic-looking guy. Uh, he's sort of Chewie Thor. I sort of really did that. Um, we maybe have to get Tim to do something like that. Yes. Um, steampunk superheroes. We have the Justice League up here in the left-hand corner. Um, and in the right hand, of course, is Steampunk Flash. Um, I'm a superhero geek, so steampunk, uh, I love any steampunk superheroes, I'm an Avengers geek particularly, so here we have steampunk Iron Man, maybe not the version that you saw, no, but the he's one a... I saw, this guy went nuts. I'm sure, um, <laughs> people love to do the steampunk ones, I'm particularly fond of the steampunk X-Men, particularly because they did the old-fashioned steampunk-powered wheelchair for Professor Xavier, mm -hmm. with the high back, with all the wicker and all of that stuff, I really think that's lovely. Um, a different version of the steampunk X-Men here, and of course we have more steampunk Avengers. I love the idea of doing Thor as a, as a turn-of-the-century blacksmith type with the, with the hammer. I just think that's totally wow. awesome. Um, because I'm a Bruce Banner and Hulk fangirl, I love the idea of, of doing Banner as the turn-of-the-century oh, scientist, cool. partially transformed as he's about to, to go. But of course, lots of ideas. Um, 
Thor with the most glorious mustache I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, you know, so again, making this all your own, looking at these characters, deciding the elements that you want to use in steampunk. Um, I did a trio to the Steampunk World's Fair in New Jersey in this May, which, if you guys have never been, is awesome. It's huge. I um, to go. But, oh, it's so good. Um, I did it with two of my, my girlfriends that were with me. I did Steampunk Catwoman, Harley <gasps> Quinn, and Ben. Nice. 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 They're really cool. I oh, I, I would love to see them. In fact, really if cool. you would give me permission, I will give you my card. If you will send me that picture, I'll credit you guys, and I'd love okay. to put you in this I, section I will, of the I presentation. Ask as long as it's, you, can, you can hold sure. off and let me know when it's okay cool with them, but I'd we love to do that. Steampunk Batman and so that he was one of the other vendors, which was really cool. That's really cool. What yeah. a great idea. Um, and of course, we can steampunk more than superheroes. Here is steampunk Disney. We have a steampunk Tinkerbell. Um, we have several steampunk Disney princesses um, as well. Some really wonderful stuff. Um, these are not cosplay per se, but I love the idea of doing, uh, they also do fan art. So for example, a gentleman came out with um, a set of turn of the century Avengers cards talking about each Avengers. Gentleman Mint, the boxer, is one of my favorites just because, <laughs> my god, that is so clever. Um, I love them, and they have the whole description of the uh, different uh, characters. Um, there's something about Hulk in a bowler hat that just kills me. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, as we all say, the, the, the essence of steampunk is a proper cup of tea in civilized discussion. Um, so let's have some civilized discussion. Actually, we might not have time to have some civilized discussion because I think we are technically out of time, although I don't know who else is coming in here. Um, thank you guys so much for coming to the panel. I do appreciate it. I am around all day, and I have no other panels, so I am happy to stick around and talk with anybody that wants to chat, steampunk or anything else. I highly recommend see this young lady's pictures because that sounds amazing. They're, they're um, good ones. Even from the con itself. Oh, share absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you guys so much for coming. I've had an amazing weekend. Yes, my friend. I don't think anyone's come in until one. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to start packing my stuff up, but you guys are all welcome to stay. We can have a chat. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. But thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. You guys are all awesome. And steampunk away, my friends. Have fun with it. Yeah.